The Winchester Mystery House is also like a pop culture reference, I guess, in that like this house has like 52 bajillion rooms in it and like something. And I guess some references have been made to it in like creepy movies. Welcome to the Asian Sewist Collective podcast. The Asian Sewist Collective is a group of Asian people from around the world brought together by our shared appreciation for fiber and textile arts and our desire to see more Asian representation in the sewing community. In this podcast, we explore the intersection of our identities and our shared sewing practice as we create a space for Asian sewists and our allies. I'm your co-host, Ada Chen, and I'm recording from Denver, Colorado. Denver is the traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. I'm a Taiwanese-American marketer turned entrepreneur, and these days you'll find me running my own all-natural skincare business called Chuan Skincare, that's C-H-U-A-N, and sharing my marketing tips on my blog, The Cultivate Method. Most importantly for this podcast, you can find my sewing at i.hope.so on Instagram. And I'm your co-host, Nicole. I'm based out of Chicago, Illinois, the original homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, and the Odawa people. I'm Filipinx American, and I'm a woman, and a lawyer by day, and a sewing enthusiast the rest of the time. You can find me on Instagram at Nicole Angeline Sews. Before we dive into this week's episode, Nicole, can you tell us about our, your current sewing project? I am. Uh, I can, actually. Um, I, <laughs> I've... I finally sort of am coming back into doing some garment sewing. I okay. just wasn't really into it at the, for whatever reason. And I became uh, upset that I wasn't into it at first. But then I'm like, no, I don't have to sew garments. I can sew whatever I want. So I have a new Fabric Mart make coming up. And I decided to make a couple of things. Uh, one is the Sew Over It Heather Dress. And it's a knee length knit dress that you can you make it in lighter knits or stable knits. And it has, you're able to color block it. So they, they have it paneled Ooh. with some inset um, pockets. Now, the reason why I chose this dress is because I, I wanted to use some of my allowance for some a, print, a printed indie pattern. So I didn't have to worry about buying and printing it myself. But I also wanted to pick a pattern where their full size range was available in print. So nice. Right. Some pattern companies, you know, if they've extended their sizes, they'll have their 6 to 18 or 6 to 20 or 0 to 20 um, PDF or printed. And oftentimes when they've extended their sizing, they'll just have the like the 18 to, to 30 or whatever it goes to as like PDF only. Um, but Fabric Mart carries so over it pattern printed patterns in both of the uh, both of the ranges for each of their items. So I was like, okay, this is important to me to pick something that is available to to everybody. So I went with that dress, and um, I picked a couple of rayon ponties up uh, to color block with them. So one is uh, black dots. And the other is actually double faced. So that means that you can use either side of the fabric, um, like there is no wrong side, but it's double faced with pinstripes, black and white pinstripes. And then the other side is plain, but I don't really want the pinstripes. I'm going to use the plain side for the color (laughs) blocking, and then I'll just use the, the, the polka dots. And I also picked up a rust colored uh, rayon like a like raw rib knit for a stay stitch Lola dress, which I've been wanting to do that pattern. It's, it's very popular and um, it's size inclusive as well. So those are my my two upcoming makes. I think by the time this comes out, it, they may already be out, but we shall see. What are you working on, Ada? Well, what I am working on is very timely and also relevant to today's guest. I am hemming this lovely bridesmaid's gown that I did not sew. It's a ready-to-wear dress, everyone, behind me. And I think I talked about it with you on Instagram Live when we were chatting about my workroom social fabric haul. And it's a cowl neck dress, clearly, as you can see. But it was like many ready-to-wear bridesmaid's dresses and formal dresses, I think, in general are... It was designed for somebody who is like six feet tall and I'm five foot four. And even with the one inch heel that I will be wearing for practicality purposes on that wedding day, I need to uh, hem quite a bit of it up. So I need to use the rolled hem foot that I bought off of eBay. And what I'm going to do is hopefully measure it out and then put it back on, have my fiance check it when when I have the shoes on. And then cut into it because you can't 
grow fabric. <laughs> and then I might cut it in like two or three goes so I don't take off too much. And then I'll practice on those scraps with the rolled hem foot to make sure that I know what I'm doing before I actually do the rolled hem on the actual garment. So <laughs> not a fun new make, just an alteration, but definitely mildly stressful because this dress has been sitting in my closet for about a year waiting for this person's wedding. But hopefully by the time, well, I know by the time this episode comes out, the wedding will have passed and I will be through and done with wedding season 2021. Yeah, you've been busy. Yeah, like I'm so over weddings, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> You have your own to plan, though, so don't don't get remind me. (laughs) Well, good luck. I believe in you. I'm sure it'll be great. Maybe. Thanks. It probably will be fine. Fingers crossed. This week's guest is Macy Knight, also known by her fashion brand and blog, Macy Camille. Welcome, Macy. Hi. How is everyone? We're doing good. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm so glad to be here. (laughs) Thanks for joining us. Do you mind telling our listeners a bit about yourself? Um, Sure. I live in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, I work full time at home. And then I also do a lot of designing and sewing on the side. I specialize in making custom gowns, but I am very much so trying to transition very hard into being a sewing blogger. It is such a task. Um, I am very much an introvert. As bubbly as everything is, I find it hard to talk a lot of times and respond back to people and be social. And social media is just that. It is just absolutely engaging into everything. So sometimes I find myself in a little bit of a task trying to make everything, then take the pictures, then talk about it and everything. But I'm really trying, guys, to merge over into transition over into the sewing blogging world. (laughs) I love it. And you also identify as Filipino-American. So can you tell us a bit about how you got started sewing and also maybe how your identity intersects with your sewing? So my grandmother, um, so I'm biracial. My um, I am white. My family's from, their side is from London. And then my other side, Filipino, they're straight from Manila. And my grandmother came over here when she was in her teens and she learned how to sew. But both of the sides coming from different backgrounds were at the time, um, were considered to be, you know, pretty poor. Just, it was just, you know, during the depression and everything And my grandmother made a lot of her clothes by curtains and sheets and stuff. So my grandmother was the first one who ever taught me how to sew. And she would have me make baby doll clothes. And (laughs) she bought me my first American doll, Samantha. (laughs) Mm. And she would have me make her clothes. So she would buy just a little bit of fabric and we would make her things. And I love doing that with her. And she had this iron sewing machine. I literally have it still in my basement because it's such a keepsake from her. But uh, she was she was pretty much the staple in how I began to sew everything. And then my culture and heritage just tied so much into it because I wanted it to be so much alive in my family as well as my daughters. And a lot of times I do typically feel like um, our culture tends to get overlooked sometimes. So I wanted to represent it in as much way as I could. And when I started fashion school, it just blossomed. Macy, you are an inspiration to me. Like I, when I, so everything that you said about wanting to bring Filipino culture into fashion and, and for, and to highlight the, the beauty of who we are and, I, I remember, I don't even remember how I found your account last year, but I'm, you're like my idol. You and Shailen oh, are like my, my yeah. like, uh, so, so both of you are on the podcast right now. Shailen is producing and just, I am so inspired by the both of you. And, and I love how the both of you, you know, are drawn to highlighting our heritage, our heritage, like not just sure. yours, ours. Like this is me too. Like yeah. when I see your makes, it's so important for me. So thank you for, for being that type of inspiration. And I want to chat with you about a specific make that's on your feed. And it may have been like 
how I found you in that, mm-hmm. you know, in totally not creepy way, I promise. Um, <laughs> But I'm talking about that amazing Filipino flag inspired gown that you made, which you posted to your Instagram on January 31st, 2020. Now, Mm -hmm. listeners, pause and go and run to Instagram and you find this gown and you look at it and, and love it. But I will describe it for you right now. It's a floor length gown that was made from muslin fabric covered in over 1000 individual pieces of blue white, red, and yellow ornaments and other pieces as well. And you're also wearing this amazing headpiece that looks like the Philippine sun. And I just love it so much. It's so cool. It's Thank amazing. You. And when you look at the dress from the viewer's point of view, it has a blue vertical section on the left, a white section in the middle with a portion of the Philippine sun in yellow in that white section, and then a red section on the right. It's just incredible. And it's like, I, I look at it like multiple times a year when I feel like I want to be inspired. I literally, I'm like at Macy Camille. This is amazing. And then I think I've posted it like five times to my stories, like just cause it's, it's so incredible. And I know you like to make garments as an homage to your Philippine heritage. You just told us Mm -hmm. that. And, and I see it on your feed. So is there anything else you'd like to say about like why it's so important for you to do that? And then I want to know what it was like to make this incredible dress. It's so important because sometimes I find it hard. My mother ended up moving back to the Philippines. So a lot of times it's just me here, but I find it hard to connect. Sometimes we don't have many Filipinos in Indianapolis and um, unlike Chicago, you know, there's, there's a mass of them. Yeah, And I find it hard to connect sometimes. So sometimes I use those things to keep it relevant within me. I still try to do things and use tra- traditions that were taught to me, but it shows much more in my clothing and things that I like to wear and things that I'm inspired by. So I think that's why it's so important to me to keep everything going and keep the heritage alive within my household. Um, just so that my children don't stray away from who they are deep down and things like that. Because, you know, they're not only just mixed, but they're Filipino. And I want them to know about those those things, those cultures, those traditions, what they do overseas. I want them to be able to go and, you know what I mean, and just really be in touch with just their roots. So um, what was it like making that dress? Oh, making the dress. <laughs> <laughs> so when I first started the dress. Um, I almost drove myself crazy. It was an unconventional (laughs) challenge. And I had no idea what I wanted to work on or the medium that I wanted to use. But I knew we were allowed to um, have a muslin and that was our base. So I just knew whatever I was going to make was going to build on top of it. And I kept thinking, what could I do? Well, it was super easy that I wanted to do something that was in relation to being Filipino. But I had no idea what medium. And it just happened to be right around Christmas time. And I was like, this is perfect. So (laughs) I went ahead and I went and got some um, ornaments. And my daughter and I, my oldest daughter, we spent so much time breaking the ornaments apart, just into pieces, just over and over again. And I knew I wanted to make a gown because uh, the gowns just run really good with me. I really could whip up a gown pretty fast. So I wanted to represent the Filipino flag. And then I also wanted to use a sort of traditional sleeve. It got hard to be extremely traditional just because the weight of all of the ornaments that were on it. Yeah. But Oh my goodness. And then, you know, what else was so hard? It was so hard to find yellow ornaments it was <laughs> almost impossible for me to find yellow ornaments mm. I had to spray paint them oh. so the red and the blue were super easy and I couldn't find just plain white ones either so I also had to spray paint those as well um I really loved making it though but each little piece was just hot glued on one at a time one at a time one at a time and the dress was so heavy it had to mm-hmm. be like 25 pounds just putting it on and just sitting there and I barely could close it up. Like I'm pretty sure the closure was uh, just a zipper just hanging on. (laughs) (laughs) 
but I absolutely love the outcome of it. I really wanted to try to submit it somewhere to see if the, like a museum or something would take it, just hoping that it wouldn't go to waste. But yeah, I really did love making the dress. That's incredible. And um, what's, what's it doing now? And what size is it? Can I wear it? <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm just I kidding. I could wear it. <laughs> it's way too big. But otherwise, <laughs> I would let you have it. But um, it is just, it's literally hanging out in storage. It's literally just sitting there. But it's so bad because, you know, over time, hot glue just really isn't the perfect thing to hold it together. So like, if I move it just a little beads and ornaments just all crack and pop off of it. Oh, so it's literally yeah. just laying there. <laughs> Hope we will find a good home for it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it'd be really cool to see that in a museum. But that was at the beginning of this year. You posted it at the beginning of this year, but you were talking about Christmas of last year. So yes. I'm curious, what are you currently sewing? So right now, I know this sounds bad, but I am currently not really sewing anything because my mind is trying to transition into fall. And there are <laughs> so many summer makes that I did not post. And I have just been thinking about how am I going to turn this into a fall make? Like, how am I going to mm. layer this up to be fall? Um, I have worked on the Sicily dress, a gray dress by uh, Terry Marsh or Terry Marsh. Um, I love, and I love that dress. Now, those are some things, and I've also made the saltwater slip by Friday Pattern Company, and those are just, like, summer things, and I'm sitting here trying to think about how I'm going to layer them up for fall, but there has been some content that I've made that I just have not been able to take pictures of or just haven't really felt like it. But my next project that I am working on is um, a super quick make. But I want to make, I already have the coat made um, by a Mimi G pattern, and it is like a peach color. But now what I want to do is I want to make a little bit like of a different contrasting Nico top. So the Ooh. Nico top is, um, if you've seen it, it's just like mm -hmm. a turtleneck. And then I just want to make a long sleeve one. And then I want an olive green skirt, just like with a belt buckle and everything. Yeah, so just, just sounds play beautiful. on colors. Yeah. It screams and then fall. just hopefully some uh, boots and yeah. But I think that's my next thing. A lot of times I have to plan these things out in my head and then think about it, how much I'm going to love wearing <laughs> before I just dive right in. And it gets really bad sometimes. <laughs> I get stuck in my head a lot. Like I think, cause, cause I think of all the possibilities yes. and then I'm like, okay, then I'm like, but what, but then there's this and, and then there's all, oh, but look what Macy did. I love what she did. Okay. <laughs> you know, oh, Ada made that thing. I like that too. And then like, you know, two months later, I've not made anything for myself at all. Oh, so yeah. I totally understand that. You talked earlier about how you liked, you know, you want to transition into doing more blogging. The pictures on your Instagram are gorgeous. So I can see that Thank they, you know, you. I don't take for granted that that takes work and time for sure. Can you tell our listeners, you know, what, what they can find on your blog and what you hope to turn it into? So lately I have been trying to find my niche and, and it is, it's troublesome sometimes because sometimes I become so obsessed with what category I fall into. And when I went through design school, I always thought of myself as bright prints, heavy on florals and things of that nature. And I was always very into um, Asian culture and it wasn't even just so Filipino. Um, I've made a couple collections on um, Japanese heritage and different things. So I feel like I've always had a different type of style, but I have been working on trying to put it all into one and make it make sense for me, whereas people can get on my page and it's not, you know, a bunch of random things and it's, you know what I mean? It's, it's cohesive. I want something to be cohesive. Mm -hmm. So I have just um, literally been working on trying to do that. Now, my designing and my sewing blogging, I feel like are distant cousins. <laughs> like I make a lot of gowns and I'm really good at designing gowns and creating gowns, but sewing blogging, 
you obviously can't wear your gown out everywhere. And then it just becomes the idea of what are we going to do with all these gowns, guys? <laughs> so <laughs> I have been trying to work hard on making it all make sense for me. But um, yeah, I would call my style um, very, I don't know. Sometimes guys, like I just really fall into flowers and even more so like gardening and plants around the house and my sewing room if I switch the camera around it's a huge collage of florals so I really fall into that sometimes and I have been working on it and I think it's a big play on modern feminine style and yeah I just really love it sometimes but sometimes I'm like okay am I cottage core am I leaning towards 70s I really like 60s and I get lost in it sometimes guys <laughs> and you mentioned before like the process of going to fashion and design school um a few years ago do you mind telling our listeners since you said they're kind of like two different parts of your world do you mind telling our listeners who might be a little more familiar with the sewing side what was the process of applying to fashion school like so when I applied to fashion school I first went now now this gets really good because (laughs) I first went to fashion school back in 2008 I graduated high school a semester early so I could go straight into fashion school And my grandma talked me out of it. She said, you should focus on trying to be a nurse. She said, (laughs) sorry, that's like, (laughs) I, I I feel that to my core. (laughs) You should be a nurse. You will always have a job if you're a nurse. Mm -hmm. And I said, grandma, I said, I just don't know if I could have the mental capacity to be a nurse. I said, I just don't know if I can do it. And she said, no, you should really try to be a nurse. So I ended up switching majors for my grandmother to be a nurse. And guys, I went to um, IU and for a little bit, I tried to do that, just that. And it just, you know what? I was at IU and I said, maybe I should switch to fine art. And so then it started going right back into design. And I took a couple uh, years there at IU, and then I ended up going right back to fashion school. So I went and graduated from the Art Institute of Indianapolis. I applied, and then initially, they do it just like any other college. They'll have you send in your scores, and then you have to take a placement test to see if you need any more work, um, like any more math, any more English, just almost like regular college does. And then you just dive right in. And I almost chose between the Art Institute and Ball State. The only reason why I did not choose Ball State was just because it had more courses that did not tie in directly to fashion. They wanted you to take more things like chemistry, biology, things that, you know what I mean, might not necessarily tie straight in like construction or anything. But at the Art Institute, your main courses were all art. So we focused on a lot of like foundation 101 and how movement happened and draping. And so it just, it was just completely different, but yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a really neat experience. And our, and our grandmas uh, have a big influence on, (laughs) on how we think who we are and and what we do. So I, I definitely understand that. And So you learned at home with your grandma from a very young age, making these doll clothes and you kept teaching yourself until you did get to fashion school. So Mm -hmm. what would you say was the most valuable part of fashion school for you? I think my senior year was the most valuable because it's literally your senior collection. That is when you're pretty much hands off with the teachers and they're just simply there to guide you. You do all of your construction, you make all the clothes, you make all the purchases, then you make a plan to sell it. How much would your item cost? How much money would you get back from this? It's it's so much research. It's a lot of going into trends and forecasting. It's just truly who you are and seeing it come alive. And I think that's the best part of um, doing that. But my 
senior collection was over Cebu, the Philippines. And um, my, yes. And cool. my collection was called Paralumen. And it's, it's a muse. So it was everything that inspired me. So of course, it was very tropical. And it was the Philippines. And I just loved it so much. Now that was very vibrant colors and very tropical. And it was just everything to me. Um, I actually still have a lot of the pieces here. And um, I have them posted at the very bottom of my feed, I'm pretty sure. I was going to say, can, can we, can we find them? Cause I, I would love, yes. I would love to see that. <laughs> yes. And we have had other designers on our show previously, but you're actually our first guest who specializes in formal wear. So could you talk to us a little bit about your process? Like when you make a garment, like they're all one of a kind, right? Yes. They are very much so one of a kind. I don't typically ever use a pattern Um, like I don't use any big four patterns. I don't use any indie patterns. I know a lot of times people make custom things for others and they'll use a base pattern. I don't, I just dive right in and I drape a lot of my clothing happens to be tool. And that's really big what I'm into right now. So I'll start with draping on our mannequin and I'll just add the layers more and more. And then I will build on top of it. But I think the hardest thing with formal wear is it gets so big and my (laughs) machine is not an industrial machine and I'm literally holding the machine down and trying to push it along because it is so big. Um, A lot of times formal wear comes with hand sewing and, you know, that really makes it couture, but I truly love making gowns. Um, Gowns, I probably sew faster, way more than I do anything for myself. Gowns, I can like literally pop out in a day or two, but clothes for myself, it takes, it takes a very long time. It could take like a few weeks or things of that nature. It depends on how into it I am. Okay. Follow-up question to the gowns you can apparently bust out in a day or two, which yes. props to you on a home sewing machine. You mentioned tool and obviously like tool it it can get very large like you said and it's poofy do you have any tips for working with tool because I may have some in my stash that I like bought on a whim from a secondhand reuse store I bought some oh sorry yeah like to say I bought some because I saw one of Macy's posts and I remember (laughs) messaging you I'm like Macy I'm gonna make a tool skirt and like you should do it and I was like okay and now I have this tool and I I don't know what to do with it. So yes, been really in in the last like year or two, and so tips. Give us for all sewists. your tips. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great question because I don't find a lot of times that tool is hard to manipulate or use. Um, I think when you use tool, you should just go for it. It's really not hard to actually work with. Um, I usually typically don't use it with patterns. I have tried to use it with patterns one time and that was for my holiday skirt and it turned out so bad. I had to take it apart and then redo it again. Mm. But I think with tool, you just dive straight in because it's so hard to mess up. Tool is just like a polyester type of nylon type of material. It's obviously man-made. It's nothing natural. And it's so cheap that you can just go back and buy, you know, your couple more yards for $1.99 and just, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? I truly feel that there's not one tip other than do not be scared to mess up. I feel like that is the only thing is do not be scared to mess up whatever thing that you're working on because it's so easy to fix. Even with holes and stuff, if you have a hole in tool, you just keep cutting and then it blends in with everything else. <laughs> Nobody's going to see it. <laughs> We're going to fix that hole and just, <laughs> yes, and just keep going. <laughs> okay. So be confident. <laughs> yes. Be confident. Believe in yourself. So follow up question again. Um, your, your daughter just turned 10 recently this yes. year. And on your feed, you made her a beautiful gown with a lot of tulle. So for folks listening, again, go to Macy's feed, but it's a floor length gown and the bodice is a one shoulder bodice with a a large bow uh, over the shoulder and then just a tulle, uh, flowy, big tulle skirt. Now, how much tulle did you use in keeping in mind that this is for a 10 year old? Because 
I would want to scale it up and then, you know, figure <laughs> out like how much more tool I would need. Cause I feel like the numbers that I read about how much you need are, are just like astronomical. Like you need a lot. So how many yards of tool do you think did you use for your daughter's dress? I know for a fact. So I buy, now this is a really good hint. So this is the most helpful thing I could ever tell you with tool. Get your tool off of Amazon. They will come in packets and bolts of 40 yards for like $5. <laughs> That's like the best price, right? And yeah. then if you don't use it, you return it. So that is the biggest, most helpful thing. I usually, for an adult, I buy three packages for the long gown. Like, yeah. And then there, it, you know, only be like $15 or so. But my daughters, I know for a fact that I used a little bit under 40 yards. And I know that sounds like a lot, but it was just one of those package bolts um, for about $4.99 for her. I remember hearing, I think, um, Monica from That So Monica talk about her first make. And she mm -hmm. said she had like 40 yards of tool just like draped all across the house, like trying to work <laughs> yeah. with it. and. And that's how I imagine it working for me and just not working at all. But I'm feeling um, more empowered by our conversation. So we'll see how yes. it goes. You totally have this. <laughs> <laughs> so a few months ago, you were also featured on Indianapolis Monthly. Congrats. Thank that you. That is amazing. Can you tell us, for anyone who hasn't seen it, which listeners who don't live in Indianapolis – that's probably sure. you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the collection that was featured and what that was like? So a company reached out to me. Well, Indianapolis uh, reached out to me and they were asking what I thought about the fashion scene in Indianapolis. And being truthfully blunt, I told them I didn't feel like there was much of one. Um, we all very much lean towards the norm here. Whereas you can go to Chicago and you'll see so many different styles, you know, but very much bundled up to make sure everyone's warm. But mm -hmm. you know what I mean? you'll see all of the styles. You'll see people express themselves in clothing. Whereas I feel like Indianapolis plays it very safe. They don't have, you know what I mean? They don't have not necessarily a sense of style, but it's, it's just very safe. It's very much like the other person. And I just really express that to them um, that I would love to see more things happen. But what they picked up on was my gowns. And so it wasn't necessarily a collection. It was just over the work that I do and what I specialize in. So the very first one was actually truly is what got me started sewing gowns was um, one of my close friends, Pepper. She asked for a holiday winter gown and it's red. And she said, I really want it really long. And she was inspired by Jennifer Lopez. She said, I kind of wanted something like that. And I said, okay, anytime someone brings me something from a celebrity and says they want it just like that, just know it will never be just like that. Yeah. For design purposes, I just absolutely cannot copy another person. And then also for design purposes, I also cannot replicate anything else just like how that person did it because I don't know what they did. I don't know what structure, but it was just basically showing and detailing um, the work that I do. And it had um, a few different dresses in there, about three or four, and they were just all tool and just showed everything. I just was so surprised that they put it in a magazine. I thought it was literally <laughs> just an interview. And then when I saw the pictures and then it was on the second page, I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. so it was really exciting. And, um, I was, I was truly happy about it. Yeah. It's another, it's amazing to see your own work in, in print. And I think, um, for me, I, I had a, um, I had an article come out in an online magazine as well. And just like seeing what you do through someone else's eyes. Like mm -hmm. I'm sure you gave them the photos and then they – like they, they laid it all out. Like I think that's a really amazing feeling and like what an accomplishment for you to oh, be in that you. magazine. Um, can we – is there like an online interview that we can link to? So they are very – so they do not have – I don't believe that they have like an online thing um, because they are very like subscription-based. Oh, I see. So even more so, you could not go up to like a newsstand and just buy one. 
Yeah. I got I, I gave my last copy to my grandmother. <laughs> oh, <laughs> see, and that's yeah, perfect. She said, Can I please have one? So <laughs> I gave it to her. <laughs> So if someone else wants to follow in your footsteps as an inspired sure. to start making their own formal wear, do you have any tips for just like regular old home sewists like us who want to maybe dive into making formal wear? So I do have tips. Um, one, you become best friends with the Pinterest board. <laughs> I, Me and Pinterest are like this. I bounce so many ideas and inspiration off of Pinterest. Um, and I always feel like when you start sewing something, you need to go into your ideas of what you want to make. But the next thing is, is you want to start with relatively cheap um, material. I would hate for someone to go out there trying to start something new and then really invest into it. And then it doesn't necessarily turn out the way they want it to. But I think something big is, is with me, I am still learning. Um, different things about techniques and sewing. I recently made something for myself and I saw a lot of other people make it beautifully and it did not come out as beautifully for me. And it was nothing wrong with the girl's pattern or anything. Um, I actually made, um, it was the the Daria Rose Boussier. Boussier. Yeah, Boussier. And I made that and I don't know if I sized up or something wrong but it just did not look as good on me as it does everyone else I'm like wow you guys did good okay <laughs> here, here mine is and I'm like this is, looks a little struggling <laughs> but I just I say that to say do not be hard on yourself because everyone has a start somewhere and I think that's so big is that you know you just go ahead and try but my very first start is when I was younger and my dad, um, my dad used to buy me, well, he bought me my first sewing machine and he used to buy me fabric. He would take me to Joanne's and let me pick fabric. I always picked out floral, I mean, not floral fabric, but formal fabric. And I would just start with a simple silhouette of a pattern. And I just kept on building on that. So one of my first gowns that I ever made, and I still have a picture of it, and I look back, and it's horrendous to this day. <laughs> but it was, it was this prom gown, and it was it was a really pretty design. But the fabric that I chose to line it with, like it was a nice brown, um, like charmeuse type of fabric, and it was so soft and silky. And then I lined it with like a pink like this bright pink color and it was it's just so tacky like <laughs> look back at it now but looking back um I just think little steps like that just help me build up things and I think you should just keep, keep uh, constantly keep trying to perfect your craft because there will always be new techniques and new things that you learn and I love watching tutorials um online and there's a lot of people out there especially like I know it sounds bad, but a lot of older people that have picked up on so many techniques that, you know what I mean? You don't always know everything. And so I like to watch a lot of tutorials as well. And, it, you know, it's not bad that they're older. <laughs> like, sure. we, this is who we learn from, right? Yeah, I mean, right. The, the folks that have been doing this for, for a long time, you know, uh, teaching, teaching us the next generation. Now, Macy, you have me thinking mm -hmm. about wanting to make a like Filipino inspired tool something. I'm not a, like my personal style isn't really tool. Like I, I'm not yeah. very girly. I'm, I'm more, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I don't know how to describe my style either. Like I think of, I've recently landed on like Mindy Kaling as like my style inspiration. So I don't know if uh -huh. you know her. She's the actor from like The Office. And yes. Um, so she's. Like, I love her style, but mm -hmm. now I'm like, I want to make, I want to make something like out there and I want it to be yeah. tool <laughs> and I want it to be blue and red and white and yellow. Um, but it, it's gonna, it's, I, I can't think of a way to make it like, um, not tacky. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it would not be tacky. It might be. There's always no. things that, you know what I mean? You could do and, you know, sometimes it's just you're the artist and it's how you feel and how you want it to, to look. And you know what I mean? I don't think it would be tacky to make anything, especially when you have something, you know, with the background of this is Filipino inspired, then everybody will see where you drew inspiration from other than 
here's my tool skirt with 16, you know what I mean, different colors <laughs> tied into it. I think it'll be beautiful. Okay, we'll see. Like, um, Saweetie for uh, Met Gala yeah. costume had, <laughs> oh like, Filipino-inspired colors. Yeah. And I was just like, yeah. I, I think – it helped for me, like making pieces that are related to my heritage. And I've only done it like three times is, is so special because it helps with the creativity. And then I do feel like as I'm making it, I connect with family history and, sure. and like global Filipino history and culture. And um, one of our guests earlier this season, Sandeep said the same thing when she was making her Indian suit, like as she was making it, she felt really like, you know, connected to her heritage in a way that is unique um, when making mm-hmm. clothes. So maybe I'll do a tool something or other in the next. I saw yours for seam work and it was so beautiful. Oh, what if you made you. a skirt that you could wear with that jacket? The jacket's like a, like a, it's not weird. It's, it's like cotton, a purple right? color. I'm not sure. It's like, it was like a Walmart rem. It was supposed to be a twall, but then I got like too caught up in life and it became what it, it became the final product. Um, no one has to know. Oh, well, I've just said it on the podcast, <laughs> but um, that out. It's, it's fine. No. Um, yeah, I think I'm looking forward to thinking about my new make. Did you uh, get around to making anything for this month's uh, Filipino American History Month, Macy? I don't know if I know that you've done it in the past, but... I have done it in the past. I haven't this year. I just have been so, actually, I just started a new job and I have been getting used to that and everything. And I just really haven't been able to make too much of everything. You know, what's so funny is I was, I was going to make um, my fiance an outfit for us to go to St. Louis in for something for him to wear. He was saying that he didn't, I went out and bought all this fabric got started on the patterns then I was like I don't have time to do this so it's literally <laughs> sitting right next to me right now <laughs> that'll probably be the next thing I work on <laughs> oh yeah I, I I had all these plans to do something special too and I was like it's okay <laughs> like yeah. it'll come back around and I don't have to make it for Filipino American History Month I could just make right. whatever I want when I want sure of course relevant question so We've talked about this in our DMs. We gri- we griped about it, but I saw or we saw on your feed that you recently got engaged, Macy. Congrats! Thank you, guys. We have we have griped about wedding planning because we are both not fans. But are yeah. you planning on making your wedding gown and or sewing anything for your wedding, or maybe even for your fiance? So, I have thought about it. I absolutely am leaning towards no for the wedding dress. But it would not be me without something, with a little bit of spice or something. <laughs> so I thought about for the reception, and I saw I saw this before, but there was this Filipino gown, and it, it, it had the turn on sleeves, but it was so, like, tailored to her body. And hopefully I'll lose weight by then. Okay? So it was so <laughs> tailored to her body, and it was so beautiful. It had beading on it and everything, and it was an ivory color. Now that is something I would like to do for my reception is I don't necessarily want the stress of making a wedding gown. I feel like that'd just be too stressful dealing with everybody and you know what I mean? Trying to get everything together, but I would love to make like a reception dress and it be something like that. Now, truthfully speaking, I do want to have a Filipino wedding, but Anthony (laughs) said that he said, maybe we should have something where everybody (laughs) would feel like, yeah. He was like, how do you know everyone wants Filipino food? Okay, but I want Filipino food. <laughs> and it's your wedding. And yeah. also, it's right. good food. <laughs> oh my gosh, it truly is. Thinking of all the lumpias that will just be sitting there. Mm. Well, This might be a, a controversial <laughs> take, but I think generally Asian weddings do it better on food than like a Western oh, yeah. style reception. Yeah. Yeah, and I've had some, I've went to some weddings lately, and I've just been like, what is this? Like, what am I eating? <laughs> like, and I completely get it, you know what I mean? Like, you have to sacrifice somewhere, but, wow, I just would love some uh, some good food on my wedding day. I think that's on, great. 
Yeah, on ours, we did the um, like the plated food at the reception area, but this is something that like I know our family has done. So it's it's Amer- it's like I don't know general American food. It was sure. nice, um, but then at after that. There's a table where family brings food. So like yeah. they will bring nice. like the Filipino desserts and then they'll someone will bring like toron or lumpia and like, you know, oh and sometimes God. at some parties, like you'll even see like pancit like at the, because people will like be dancing and drinking and then get hungry later. So instead of bringing in yes. like the late night bites, like whatever mini cocktail wieners, but like <laughs> you would just have this table where you could bring your own food. Um, and I think that's what we did for our wedding, but it was so long ago. Um I don't, I don't remember if we did like hot food or if it was just like desserts, but uh-huh. um, yeah, it's a, it was a, it's a nice way to, to be able to incorporate all that. So. Oh yeah. I went to Have one. Have you done any wedding planning? Me? Yes. I am, <laughs> I have my outfits <laughs> planned. <laughs> I like you opted not to make my gown because it, at first of all, I have never made a gown. I've made some formal dresses, but not a gown. So I didn't want to kind of put that extra stress on myself. I also, for me, I know this is like going to be a controversial opinion, but for me, like the wedding gown is kind of like the thing that like I always idolized, like growing up, like not even being like, I want to get married, just like a cool gown that you get to wear. (laughs) And I, we didn't have a lot of money when I was in high school. So my sweet 16 was literally like a party in the basement. So I didn't get a gown for that. And Mm -hmm. my prom dresses were either like, 15 bucks from the night market in Taiwan that I brought back or like Mm -hmm. super, super discounted in the back of like the Lord and Taylor. And so I never got the experience of wearing like a gown gown. Um, And so I really, really wanted to go all out and I bought mine last year. And then I bought, I also, I ordered it Um, and it is by a Filipino American designer. And then I, uh, it was going to take a few months. And so we thought we were mm-hmm. going to have like a little shotgun ceremony outside of my dad's skilled nursing facility in the window. So I bought another gown uh-huh. <laughs> off a rack from a sample sale. I had it like tailored and fitted and cleaned. And that did not end up happening um, before my dad passed. And so I have two yeah. gowns now because the original gown arrived in a big, big box. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Like a standing, it arrived in a standing wardrobe box. That's how big <laughs> it is. And so I have two gowns and I'd also already ordered a suit that I wanted to wear for like pre-wedding activities. Like this really cool mm-hmm. white suit. Like how many times do you get to wear white suits? So my plan right. is that suit just came with shorts and, and a suit jacket. So I'm going to make, I have the fabric already um, to make like a top in the middle and I'm there that there will be twalling on that and like whatever. But I figured that would be something that I could then transition into more daily wear. Like I don't know what I'm gonna do with these two dresses yet afterwards and even if I'm gonna keep the the sample sale one that I got. But um yeah, all the outfits are planned and none of the rest is planned. <laughs> Anybody <laughs> listening who is on the invite list probably knows that. <laughs> but yeah. Y'all are making me want to get married again to my same husband, to like to the same person because we're very hey, much you in love. You could do a vow renewal ceremony. That's Absolutely. I've thought about that. I did preserve my wedding dress and then I was like, it'd be cool to kind of, I mean, I don't feel sentimental about it and we're not having kids, so I don't, I'm not going to pass it along to anybody, but I'm like, cut it up and like make a 10 year anniversary dress or something. Um, I have a, I have a reception dress that I never put on. It's still in my closet. Really? Like, yeah, I just was like. I'm having a fun time in this. It's fine. (laughs) And uh, so, yeah, I just, it's like a trumpet style dress and with a sweetheart neck and it's just sitting in my closet still. Um, I don't fit into that. I'm almost certain that that will not fit me anymore. (laughs) Either of them. Trumpet means there's fabric to use. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So we'll see. I love listening, like hearing about uh, where everyone planning because I'm like, oh, I'd like to do that. But (laughs) we'll see. I was going to say one of my very good friends who got married a few weeks ago, I did not, I rewore a dress to her uh, wedding because she requested black tie and I have one formal black tie dress and I'm going to wear it till it's done. But she changed up dresses because they had postponed the wedding from last year and her mom really wanted her to wear a cheap haul at the end to like send people off and she really didn't want to. 
Um, and she was just like dead set against it. She's like, I don't like how it looks on me. I don't like how it fits, oh, all this stuff. And and I was trying to explain to her all the history we had done research on into it because I thought that might help. But she was just dead set against changing. But the best part was she didn't end up changing. So I don't know what happened to this dress. It's probably somewhere at her parents' house in Pennsylvania. But her mom, going back to the food part, They didn't want a traditional wedding cake. And so what I thought was really beautiful that they did was her mom went out and that morning of the wedding, she went to seven different Asian bakeries around New Jersey and got Mm -hmm. seven different cakes, egg tarts, all the like Mm -hmm. different Chinese bakery and Korean bakery desserts you want. And because it's New Jersey, she also got like Italian wedding cookies and like all the cool Italian cookies that you get by the pound. And that was very much like part of growing up there like you would get that in school um on special occasions or whatever your teacher might bring it in or pta person would bring it in and so i thought that was like the nice a nice fusion of kind of cultures at her wedding even though she did not want to wear the outfit that her mom picked out Uh, macy i have a follow-up question for you and i'll say first that like if you don't want us to like put any of this in the in like in the um the podcast like all this wedding talk just let us know oh no it's um, fine Okay. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> so you said like you, you want to have like a Filipino wedding, but you and your fiance are talking about it. Like what does having a Filipino wedding mean to you? Like what does that look like for you? Well, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> I truly wanted to have one at first. Now he's not Filipino. So I'm trying to take into account of things that he wants as well and things that make him happy although sometimes I'm like ah oh, but does it really matter what you I'm just kidding I'm just kidding but, I hear you I hear you but um I truly did want a Filipino at first um just like how I described with the clothing I wanted to truly tie something in with my uh, culture I wanted us to take um traditional pictures with him having you know the traditional shirt on and everything and I know. I thought about it. I was uh, yeah. like, I could make you one. <laughs> oh, that's so special. So Macy's I referring know. to a barong, right? You're yes. talking about the barong, which is a men's formal wear shirt that is traditionally made with piña cloth, which is uh, mm-hmm. from pineapple leaves. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And um, my husband's white. And we, we, he got when we got married, like we we combined elements. He's from England. So there's like an extra layer of his whiteness. And like he... <laughs> I don't mean that in a pejorative way. way. Well, I mean, like, you know, American, it's different, right? And like, um, so all the men, including my Filipino family members, like my brother and my uncle, who was a sponsor at our wedding, which is kind of a Filipino slash Catholic thing, they wore English morning suits. So they wore like the three piece suit with like tr- the, all the tradition, like the coattails and everything. Uh-huh. The only thing that was missing was like a cane and a top hat. But like, oh my gosh, that was like how we did it for for his side. But when we went to the Philippines in 2018, and uh, we went for my cousin's wedding, so they're both Filipino. Um, his his wife is from the Philippines, moved to Australia. He was born in Australia, and um, my husband put on a barong for the wedding. And it was mm-hmm. so, um, I, I like I was I don't know it was just really delightful to see him in that and mm-hmm. um, he, he I'd never find him in one again you know like <laughs> at, at an event because it's such like a formal wear thing um, but I I totally understand and I'll tell you that like seeing your partner whatever he looks like like in a barong I can tell how important that would be to you and and, and yeah. it would be really wonderful yeah. I do think that I might, for the very least, try to, like, push the issue for, like, engagement pictures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Please. <laughs> you could but, do a great photo shoot day with that and, like, maybe make it, like, a cute date night. Oh, yeah. That'd be so sweet. I would love that. So I just got to try to get the – but I know, like, a lot of times, because, you know, we don't have things like that over here or the materials like that over here. Sometimes I found I find things on like certain websites or like Etsy. Etsy is has everything it feels like. Mm-hmm. So um, a lot of times that's why I've been looking at for things like that. I love it. I hope it all goes well. Thank you. Can you to wrap it up? Tell our listeners where they can find you on the internet. <laughs> Yes. So you can find me at my handle at Macy Camille, only one L 
in the Camille. And also you can reach out to me at uh, MacyCamille.com and you cannot find me on Facebook. (laughs) (laughs) We will have links to all of those places, not Facebook, on our show notes. (laughs) Thank you so much for being with us today, Macy. It's been a real pleasure to chat with you. Um, And it's personally just like very fangirly type of interview in case listeners can't tell. Um, So I'm really, really glad that you could join us today. Thank you for having me, guys. I love being here. Thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode of the Asian Solace Collective podcast. This is our last episode of season two. So we will be taking a short break for the holidays and coming back in the new year. If you like our show, please consider supporting us on Coffee. Your financial support helps us with overhead expenses and will allow us to give back to our currently all-volunteer team who works so hard to provide you with new content each week. The link to our Coffee page is ko-fi.com slash Asian Sewist Collective. And you can find the link in the show notes on our website and on our Instagram account. Check us out on Instagram at Asian Sewist Collective. That's one word. Asian Sewist Collective, and you can help us out by spreading the word and telling your friends. We would also appreciate it if you could rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. All of the links and resources mentioned in today's episode will be in the show notes on our website. That's AsianSewistCollective.com. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us with your questions, comments, or even voice messages if you want to be featured on future episodes at AsianSewistCollective at gmail.com. This episode was brought to you by your co-hosts Ada Chen and Nicole Angeline. This episode was researched by Cindy Chan, produced by Shailen Joy and Reiko Abe, and edited by Ellen Sheck and Henry Wong. Thank you so much to the other members of our collective who made this week's episode a reality. This is the Asian Sewist Collective Podcast, and we'll see you next season.